I would not start with the story of Agar, the very last. But let me give you some background. These stories in Genesis are, are like any tribal story. They're, they're deep creation myths of, of all of humanity, of the world, in fact, and then of a specific group. So you start with Adam and Eve and Cain and, a Cain and Abel and Noah and the flood and the Tower of Babel. These are stories, again, in this lineage that are for all of human beings. And then Abraham, who is called Abram, shows up. And this is the beginning of the lineage of the Jewish people. So God tells Abraham, Lech Lecha, leave your father's home, and I'm going to give you this land. And so Abraham and all his, his wife Sarah, and all their flocks, and all their servants, and all their slaves, uh, come into this land, and God says, yep, this is for you, this is for you, this is for you. But how can that be? How can God tell Abraham he's going to have a lineage of people when his wife, Sarah, has not borne him a child? They've been there 10 years, and uh, Sarah decides, look, Abraham, I'm, I'm going to give you my handmaiden, who's really a slave, I from my understanding, an Egyptian woman named Hagar, she will, I will have a child through her. So <coughs> Hagar, the concubine, quote unquote, has sex with Abraham and becomes pregnant. This is in Genesis 16. And she starts kind of looking down at Abraham. In my children's Bible, it says she got haut haughty. Um, and so uh, Sarah was pretty upset by that, and she uh, complained to Abraham, and she got really nasty with, with Hagar, who was pregnant. And Hagar left. She ran away, and then through an angel, an angel comes to her and says, what's going on? Why is this so terrible? Why did you leave? And, and Hagar says, she's being cruel to me. And the angel says, don't worry, go back. God will make you a nation, well, your son, and call him Ishmael. Ishmael means heard by God. If you know the Hebrew prayer, the Shema, the same root, Ishmael. So, and heard by God. So she goes back. This is Genesis 16, 17. Then you have all these adventures. You have the destruction of so Sodom and Gomorrah. You have another whole battle with uh, Abimelech, a king. And then you have the story of the three angels. So the three angels come to Abraham's house, or his tent, excuse me, and say, you're going to have a child. Now, meanwhile, Ishmael has been born and is growing up. Uh, it, by the time Ishmael was 13, God makes a deeper covenant with Abraham, and that's when all the males, including Ishmael, are circumcised. So you did, and well, this is a, a major patriarchal tribal happening. I don't know how else to say that. Um, but Sarah is still not pregnant, and the angels say, but, you know, your wife's going to have a child, and she overhears it, she kind of laughs at it, uh, and lo and behold, a year later, Abraham is 100. He was 86 when Ishmael was born. And now Abraham has his other son, Isaac. This is Sarah's son. And Sarah gets um, unnerved again. She's afraid that Isaac uh, will not be strong, will not be able to inherit. So she complains to Abraham again. And Abraham says, Abraham talks to God and like, you know, hey, these are my boys. And God says, no, listen to your wife. Your, your, your lineage will come through Isaac, and Ishmael too will have a great nation. So this is going on. Um, Abraham then sends Hagar out into the desert with bread and a sack, a wine sack full of water. She goes out into the desert with her baby boy. Well, 
you know it's funny it's like a baby boy but then actually he's fourteen years old there's a this there are discrepancies in the old testament and that's another conversation but she goes so but let him be a baby again and he he's put under a bush and she walks away because she doesn't want to watch him die once the water is gone but god he this is in the this is like a chapter of genesis 21 and god hears uh ishmael's cry and opens sarah up sarah's eyes and she sees a well and she gives him water and then ishmael too grows up he becomes a bowman and like his mother hagar he also marries an egyptian so that's sarah in the desert and hagar and her expulsion according to the jews according to the jews you know and of course christians and jews and muslims share a lot of the same sacred texts and a lot of the same prophets right they all share abraham that's why they're called abrahamic faiths so i want to share with you a story that has the same characters and a lot of the same background but a different perspective and a different outcome now in this story maybe hagar was a princess who was given to sarah and maybe hagar was a slave that was taken or bought by sarah we don't really know but what we do know in this story is that hagar is pious and righteous and compassionate and incidentally beautiful so after 10 years in Canaan when Abram and Sarai were 85 and Sarai wanted that child and couldn't like in the Jewish story Abram had a child with Hagar and named him Ishmael but in this story angels visit immediately and tell Sarah that she will get pregnant and she does and they have a child Sarah and Abraham and they call him Isaac now I think it's important to mention that Hagar is never actually mentioned at all in the Quran which is kind of unbelievable when you think about it so the first time that she's actually mentioned is in the late 19th century there are some Muslim historians who are writing what are called tasfir, which are, um, they're like exegesis of the Quran with a lot of commentary that give context and history and background so that all the stories make sense. So they're actually kind of elaborating on the little bit that is in the Quran. So one of the oldest is a tasfir by, called tasfir al-Tabari, and the author is Muhammad al-Tabari. So there's no one telling of the story of Hagar, but the one that comes closest to the one I'm familiar with that was told to me by, by my imam when I was in seminary is told by Aziza al-Hibri, and she's a professor emerita at Richmond Law School, and she calls Hagar the mother of her whole family. And this is the story she tells, the one that Sheikh Yasir told me so many years ago. So Hagar is still nursing Ishmael, who's not yet walking. Isaac has just been born. There's no doubt these are babies. These are little, little children. And Abraham, who at this point has been renamed by the angels, takes Hagar into this barren land and they're walking through the desert there's nothing there's no water there's no trees they're just walking and walking and the whole way she's saying abraham where are we going and he's just avoiding her he's not answering her he's averting her gaze he's not loving this by any stretch and late in the afternoon when the sun is low they get to a hill and it's casting a bit of a shadow onto the land and he puts Ishmael down and Hagar sits down and Abraham starts unpacking all of his stuff and putting it around her. 
And he's got this energy like he is leaving. So the question Hagar asks shifts from where are we going to where are you going? And he still can't answer. He's still averting her gaze. He's not, he's just not going there. He can't. And so she asks Abraham, has God told you to do this? And he says, yes, God has told me to do this. And being the pious, righteous woman that she is, she says, okay, I know everything will be okay. Go, do what you need to do. And Abraham kind of slinks off. And the only thing that's in the Quran about this story is the prayer that he gives. He says, oh God, I have made some of my offspring dwell in a valley without cultivation by your sacred house in order, O oh God, that they may establish regular prayer. So fill the hearts of some people with love towards them and feed them of fruit so that they may give thanks. And that's it. That's all that's in the Quran. But it's getting later. And even though it's getting later and the sun is getting low, it's still hot. The air is hot. It's dry. They're parched. Hagar and Ishmael are just completely dehydrated. Ishmael's hungry. Hagar wants to feed him, but she can't because her milk has dried. So she starts to get afraid. She runs up the hill and looks around and sees nothing. As far as the eye can see, there's nothing but sand. So she sees another little hill and she runs over to the top of that one. And again, she can't see anything in any direction. And so she runs back and forth seven times, getting more and more panicky. Can you imagine what that's like? Being in this place with nothing except a hungry baby who's starting to cry. And as the sun is going down, Ishmael is crying more and more. And suddenly an angel appears. And in some tellings of the story, it's a bright white light. And this is such a great angel that this angel has a hundred heads and a hundred wings and touches Ishmael. And in that moment, Ishmael stomps his chubby little foot on the ground and a well springs up and he drinks and Hagar drinks and they're given life and that is the birth of the great nation of Islam and how Hagar becomes the mother of all Muslims and to this day Muslims reenact that journey one of the five pillars of Islam is to go on Hajj to go on pilgrimage to Mecca. And they walk around that temple that was first built there. They go to the hills, which are called Safa and Marwa. And when they're finished, they drink from the spring of Zamzam, all to be in that place that Hagar was, to feel that faith, that compassion. So in this story, we don't really know what happens to Sarah. But in this telling, by these people, especially Sufis, both she and Hagar did exactly what God told them to do. They trusted. They had faith. They trusted each other. They trusted Abraham. They were good. They were righteous. There was no jealousy. There was no vengeance. They just each did what God wanted. So let's rise now in body or in spirit and sing number nine. A male cult and a male covenant with God. You know, circumcision is, is embodied. It's an embodied cult. And, and I took it, um, I think I felt terrible about it. I felt terrible about the expulsion of, of Hagar. And as I, I still was a young person, I came to the belief, I thought it was an understanding, now I see it was a belief, that part of the deep schism between Jews and Muslims was really an ancient wound created by the expulsion. Like, oh my God, these people must hate us. Look at, look at the roots of our tradition because all I had 
was the story in the old testament and the commentaries and i want to add a little bit this is still just a little more which is in the jewish tradition the rabbis create midrashim a midrash is a story tries to deal with the inconsistencies of the old testament and also i think smooth over certain glaring horrors um and so one of the inconsistencies or one of the i don't know explanation of the expulsion was well you know ishmael was older by then and he was harassing poor little baby isaac so what else could they do so that was like one of the tales to smooth over so this is in my young adulthood i'm learning things like that but there was more to learn how about you how did you how did you focus with uh the stories you got from your mom so you know i i grew up in the catholic church right so to me i knew priests and nuns you know i'm sure everybody knows that like i had five great aunts who were nuns like this was just part of reality and i remember being a little kid in catechism class and hearing about abraham being told to sacrifice his own son and it just it made no sense to me and being told this story by priests and nuns because you know of course in the catholic church you know we actually reads the bible <laughs> it's this thing you have but you're discouraged from reading it so i, I it never would have occurred to me to do that so being told this story by priests and nuns the message i got was that you know because they're celibate the message i got was that our bodies, our sexuality, even our progeny don't really belong to us, that they belong to God. And as I got older and I felt like, wow, my sexuality doesn't even belong to me and I'm not welcome in this faith because of my sexuality, I, I never questioned it. I never thought about it again. I just dismissed it as all a bunch of oppressive poo-poo that had nothing to do with me. <laughs> And it wasn't until I went to seminary. And honestly, going to UU seminary before I started, I thought that I was going for like an education in political organizing. I didn't think there was anything there about theology. So I was fascinated to take a class, two classes simultaneously, one with this great Sufi imam who we would sit at his feet as he told us all these wonderful Sufi tales, and another class on church history told by a feminist theologian. Whoa! Like they were, honestly, before I got to seminary, I'm not sure that I knew the difference between Islam and Hinduism. I mean, it sounds crazy to say now, but I think at the age of 37, I didn't really know that. And it was only then that I started really unpacking just how full of patriarchy this whole thing is. It was, it was kind of shocking. And I was thinking about all the people who don't have that opportunity to sit at the feet of a Sufi imam and to study with a feminist theologian or with you, to have this kind of conversation with you. It's kind of amazing. I feel really blessed in that way. So um, what do you feel like is the lesson for us all in the story of Sarah and Hagar? Wow. I don't know if there is a lesson in, in the story of Sarah and Hagar, but maybe in all the stories of Sarah and Hagar, um, and the multiple it, And that's stories. a good point, right? Because there's so many. Even in Islam, there are a bunch of different tellings. The only thing that is really consistent is the back and forth from hill to hill. In Islam. In yes. Islam, yeah. Right, right. Well, and... Uh, it, it's interesting, the, I mentioned the Midrash, the story that the rabbi tell. So uh, this year I got to study um, Midrashim written by women. And uh, there's a Midrash about Sarah. And the Midrash about Sarah herself are the 10 traumas that she had to go through. So all of a sudden she becomes this character. Um, and, and the kind of Midrash, these are stories like that she never gets, unlike the Virgin Mary, Gabriel comes to the Virgin Mary and says, dear, you're going to be with child. 
Sarah never gets it. She overhears an angel telling Abraham. So she's kind of uh, always on, on the side. The other deep, deep, I don't know, realization I have is, is the depth of patriarchy um, in that, and, it, and it's kind of understandable. If you look at so many of these ancient civilizations, when men had multiple wives and, and concubines, that they're all fighting for their sons, and that their sons, because if their son doesn't get in power, then probably he and they get killed. You know, there's so many fights, and you see this in, in all kind of emperor buildings. You even see with King David's sons. Solomon was not his older son, and there was all kind of battles about how Solomon ends up on the throne of King David. So I think my, my major lesson, well, my major lesson is, first of all, I feel, I feel the, um, some of the tribalness in these stories in what's going on in Israel. There are definite strands. Um, in, uh, among Jews, there's from the most fundamental to the most progressive just like in any other path. So I can, I can feel the, it's a, it's a deep, it's a deep, it's a depth to it that I, I understand. And a, and a forgiveness, I think, ultimately, that I feel knowing about the grip of patriarchy and that Sarah's cruelty was, um, came to be through her only means to obtain power. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean that's the thing about both of these women is they were utterly powerless. Right, right. And and just there's one other story in the the sacrifice of uh, what happens after the Hagar story. The next immediate story is the the sacrifice of Isaac. You know where God takes Isaac up and is going to sacrifice him. And then the next thing, and there's a whole conversation about how Sarah is not involved, but all of a sudden Abraham they're gone. And then all you hear next is that she's dead. So there's another layer of understanding that that cruelty visited on her was that also into, into relationship with her callousness toward her God. I don't know. That's what I get. <laughs> How about you? Well, what, you what's, yeah, your, I mean, what's your takeaway in terms I, of You know, I, I get the same thing. I mean, so Christianity and Islam are outgrowths of Judaism, right? I mean, they're all, um, you know, in the same way that Unitarian Universalism, especially Unitarianism, is a heresy of Christianity. You know, by heresy, it's just, it's a divergence from the dogma, it's a divergence from the creed, from the story, a different telling of the story. Um, so the roots are all in the same place, and it just, like right now when I look at what's going on in the Middle East and what's going on on our campuses, it feels like it's this tribalism gone amok. It's like there's no other way for people to have an identity other than this one that goes all the way back to this split. Um, but that's just in the extremes. That's in the, the, in the extremes. Who, in the extremes. Who are not paying attention. There's so many wonderful commentators. And, and that's the thing about it. Like if, if I look at like the Muslim tellings of the story of, of Sarah and Hagar, um, on one end, there are these ones where like both of them are pious and righteous and beautiful. Everybody's just doing the right thing because their faith is so strong. And at the other end, it's a story of, of treachery and horror, jealousy, everything else. But I think the vast majority of the stories are somewhere in between, where these are human people doing what they needed to do with what they had in order to survive and in order for their progeny to survive. And, and I feel like, you know, it's the extremes that create the tribalism that can't keep moving, but the vast majority is somewhere in between. Yeah, and I would say not only at the time, but I think that progressive movements, movements now are about shifting away from recognizing the patriarchal primitivism of old texts and almost using those texts as, no, this is what we don't want to do. How do we move from this? 
at least that's what i see in progressive judaism or you know which is full of women and full of rabbis who are women and 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 a whole other ethic yeah so i'm i'm i don't know how it's functioning in in islamic cultures but let me see what i see that's a whole other thing okay right just the way i see it women in islam were having a lot more uh power in the system up until the united states started meddling in the united states in in the middle east because you know our oil was under their soil and it just mushroomed right it gave birth to a new wave of fundamentalism there none of this is easy it's just so we were talking about the theme of pluralism though and and how and which is our theme for the month and how um by having both stories i know for me i i actually i didn't know rev denise understanding of the quran but i did a chat gbt sometime after august after october 7th i wanted to see what chat gbt chat gpt would tell me and that's when i first really learned that their story was really different and i think for me oh i now had two stories and that first of all it unhinged me a little more from the jewish story i wasn't so tightly hinged in and uh and maybe by having multiple stories and seeing that people had really different not only points of view but historic understandings and holding all of that that maybe we can be kinder more peaceful less dogmatic i i start seeing pluralism as a force that's really helpful right and that's why pluralism is such an important part of our new understanding of our 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 bylaws and our principles um there's so many different tellings of every biblical story i mean like even even within the christian bible like there's four different tellings of the story of christmas there's so many different tellings of every single story i mean i didn't think within unitarian universalism all the different understandings of henry david thoreau right it's amazing how when people talk about him he's like this social justice warrior who happened to live in this cabin and for others it was all about the cabin and nature and the truth is it's both of those things and so much more that really occupied so much sure like like the women who came to feed him while he was being heroically <laughs> on city on all that time exactly right and Ralph Waldo Emerson's wife who did his laundry and, yeah and 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 it's all part of a bigger story and no one detail of that is the whole story but everybody picks on like holds on to that part that sort of affirms their identity and who they are and who they want to be and you can kind of forget the rest of it and i think that's why pluralism is so important it's like by getting all these different stories these different perspectives we're getting a better idea of the complete picture and we don't have to base our entire identity on just part of the story well i don't think yeah you know the whole thing of identity i think is tricky i think we're too attached to identity to begin with but i'm 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 reading too much buddhism well there is that so um thank you thank you for sharing this conversation with me so um i'd like to invite you all to now rise as you're willing and able and open your teal hymnal to number 1026 if every woman in the world